Hey guys, Jay Steven here. I wanted to address this issue of how Crusader chainmail, Crusader armor from the high middle ages stacked up against the Turkish mounted archer. A while back, in fact, a long time ago, very early on when I was first getting interested in the Crusades, in fact, there was a documentary that was shown, I think it was the History Channel, about the Crusades. And one of the questions they asked was, well, how did a, a Crusader knight stack up against a, a, a Turk, against a Seljuk Turk? And to test this, they had, they took a dummy <laughs> and put some chain mail on it. You know, some modern, modernly made chain mail. And then they had a guy on a horse gallop past this dummy and shoot at it with a bow and arrow while he was mounted. So, and of course, the point here is that you know, the Crusaders, they were, um, they were mounted lancers for the most part, while their, their infantry uh, were the ones who used uh, bows. Meanwhile, the Turks had mounted archers, which is a very interesting way to fight and very helpful. And so this has always been kind of an interesting question. How did the Crusader Knight stack up against this uh, swift mounted Turkish archer? But anyway, this experiment that this show on the History Channel did, I remember at the time, I thought it didn't really make a lot of sense. I, I wasn't sure why at the time. because this, this was very early on in my interest in the Crusades. I didn't know that much about the Crusades at the time. I, I certainly didn't know a whole lot about the, the dynamics and the fighting styles between the Crusaders and the Turks. But yeah, so so what they did is again they just had this dummy with chainmail on it, and they had a guy ride past it and shoot an arrow at it, and of course the arrow goes right in. And their conclusion was that the Crusaders had the odds stacked against them. They kind of said in a joking tone. Um, so yeah, their conclusion was that the Turks were at an advantage. Okay, so is this the truth? And I remember at the time I thought there was something wrong there. There was something wrong with the whole way they were posing this experiment. I, again, I wasn't sure what, but today I'm going to tell you what exactly is wrong with that experiment and why it doesn't tell us anything about the fighting dynamic between a Crusader Knight and a Seljuk Turk. I think, first of all, the thing that's most obviously wrong about this experiment is that the Crusaders were not dummies on a post that just sat there <laughs> and let the Turks shoot arrows at them. You know, far from it. So, and another thing we have to point out is that the armor that is on this dummy is is incomplete. It's totally incomplete. The chainmail suit, or halberk, as it was called, was only one component of a Crusader Knight's armor. Indeed, it was kind of a complicated system that was quite effective. The Crusaders, under their chain mail, they wore just kind of a, a padded under jacket or undershirt of some kind. It was a quilted affair. But yeah, basically what amounts to a very thick, quilted, padded undershirt. And this was worn underneath the chain mail itself. And then over the chain mail, the knight wore another jacket type of thing, a um, kind of an overcoat, um, a, a more loose overcoat. And, of course, on top of that, he's got his helmet. And then his chain mail uh, suit includes a hood that's attached to it, which covers his chin as well as his head. And then his, and then his helmet uh, covers the top of his head. And then he's got um, his chain mail suit kind of extending down, kind of almost over his, down to his knees, almost, with sort of a split uh, along the sides of the legs uh, to accommodate him riding, but then he may even wear um, uh, mailed leggings. But anyway, the point is that in the battlefield, in action, this was quite effective. So now let's take a look at the, the Turks. So the Turks were a very light cavalry. This was The emphasis was on speed. They were not heavily armored, and they carried a very light bow uh, that shot light arrows. It had to be. You know, if you're if you're sitting on a horse and, and the Turks 
rode fairly small horses, they rode kind of these small, swift mares, then you're not going to be able to carry a, a massive bow. You know, this wasn't the massive bow of the English uh, longbow, the, the longbowman. This was a, a, a light bow that could be wielded from atop a horse. Okay, so now let's put this uh, quickly moving Turkish horse archer up against the Crusader cavalry. Well, in the field of action, the, the Turk has got to, he's got this approach of harassment, right? So a Turkish cavalry, their idea is they ride in on um, the, the marching crusader formation, and their goal is to ride in swiftly, shoot some arrows, and then ride away quickly. Because they can't stay close for long, because if they do, then they're going to be attacked by the crusaders. And of course, they're lightly armored, they're a light uh, soldier, and so they're not going to be able to withstand against these heavily armed crusaders. So they ride in, they shoot some arrows, they ride out. They ride back, shoot some more arrows, ride, ride out, and over and over again. And the whole point of this is to try to harass the crusaders to, for one, get them to ride after them. Because if they ride after them, they break up their formation and they, they're no longer protected in their formation. And then the Turks can... Uh, can sort of isolate them and uh, maybe take them down that way. But you can kind of already see, I think, how differently this situation is going to play out from our little experiment that the History Channel did where they had a guy riding straight at a dummy and shooting an arrow into it. So first of all, the majority of arrows these Turks shoot are going to miss. They're going to hit nothing. And then after that, the arrows that they shoot are going to face another obstacle, and that is, of course, the Crusader Infantry. Now, the Crusaders had a very specific way of organizing themselves in the field, and that was with tight formations. And this was actually developed um, in, as a result of experiences that the Crusaders had in the First Crusade. We can actually see this development take place uh, at the Battle of Dory Lamb. If you'll remember, at the Battle of Dory Lamb, this was kind of one of the first times the Crusaders really met a a large Turkish force out in the field. There was a previous battle at Nicaea, but it was was really not on the scale that happened at Dory Lamb. And the thing that the Crusaders found very quickly was that if they tried to ride after the Turks on their light mares, they couldn't catch them. And so, like, you know, these, these Turkish uh, mounted archers would ride in and harass uh, the Crusader uh, knights, and... So some of the knights would kind of ride off and try to like take them down, you know. Well, of course, that would get them away from their group, and they would get then further attacked and they and killed, and the, their horses would get killed underneath them. And so the thing that Bohemond did immediately was he had the knights come in, and he had a lot of them dismount and form an infantry screen around the horses, and this immediately made the the harassment tactic of the Turks pretty ineffective because now you've got these these uh, solid infantrymen who are well armored in in mail and they've got their their large kite shields and uh, they're able to pretty much deal with uh, this harassment tactic of the Turks and meanwhile if the Turks ride in too quick too uh, closely well then the the crusaders have their own archers and they can and they've got um uh, uh crossbows which can be used uh, to hit more effectively and do more damage. And so the Turks can't ride in too close because they will get um, a crossbow right in the skull. And they don't have heavy armor either, so it makes it even, even tougher. So as a result of this experience, the Crusaders developed this, this consistent strategy of always keeping infantry in close proximity with their cavalry, especially when they were on the move. And they would use the infantry as a screen, so infantry would march alongside the knights to screen them against potential ambush by these lightly um, armored, swift Turkish harassers. Now, on top of this, the Turks have another problem when they're faced up against a crusader knight. And that is the way that chain mail actually interacts with arrows in, in real time. Again, we're not talking about a dummy standing there Stationary, you can just aim right at it and hit it where you want to hit it. Let, let's say we've got um, 
Crusader cavalry in the field uh, fighting up against Turkish mounted archers. And they're close enough to actually engage in a fight. Well, for one thing, remember that the Crusaders have that heavy padding underneath their mail, which adds a whole other dimension of protection. Now, I don't know if you guys are subscribed to Lindy Beige. I recommend him, but he did a really good video about this where he talked about how chain mail actually gives and moves with a blow. So let's say a Turkish archer is able to hit a crusader, um, a crusader knight with his arrow. Well, that arrow more than likely is going to zing off of the chain mail. So chain mail, it's made up of all these little tiny curved chain links. So what that amounts to is that kind of acts as a deflecting thing. So an, a projectile that's sailing through the air hits that and it's, it's going to bounce off. It's going to skid off of the chain mail and the padding underneath the mail actually helps to do this because it creates even more of this rounded kind of thick surface. And, and so, yeah, there, a lot of times these Turkish arrows would have zinged off of chain mail. And keep in mind, too, the Turks are using light arrows. So these are not arrows that are intensely powerful, that have a lot of power to just, you know, zip right through or, or cut right through um, armor like that. Um, and, you know, they're, they're, they're shooting them at a long distance and they are uh, sailing through the air a long distance. So that's, that's slowing them down, too. And we know this, too, because now what do the Turks do when the Crusaders get close to them? Well, we know what they do. They flee. They take off because they have to. If they're close enough to where they can really aim really well, then that means that the Crusaders are close enough to charge them with their heavy lances and their heavy horses and smash them, which is what frequently happened when Crusaders got close enough to Turks. And so once they get pretty close, they're going to take off running and they're just going to go into full flight mode. They're not going to, um, they, they may be able to turn around and shoot off a few uh, arrows, but, but more than likely they're going to be, they're going to be running. And we know this is what they do too, because our sources talk about this. The Gesta Regis Riccardi when it talks about what it was like dealing with the Turks in the field, talks about how you, know, you get close enough to them, they just take off. And he talked about how it was annoying because, you know, they'd be uh, the knights would be trying to to maybe take down a, a group of Turks, and as soon as they got close enough, the Turks would just scatter. So, so that's kind of the issue here. So yeah, this idea that you know Crusader armor, Crusader chainmail. Well, it was just useless against arrows. That's nonsense. That is absolute nonsense. Uh, in fact, quite the opposite. We can see how it was very, very useful. Indeed, it was so useful and so effective that the Muslims themselves became interested in it. Um, Usama ibn Munkid, one of my favorite Muslim authors who wrote this uh, brilliant uh, chronicle of his life, or I guess more memoirs of his life, he actually talks about how he owned a very good uh, suit of Frankish chainmail which he um, used with a, a padded uh, jacket, like we're talking about. So, yeah, a lot of these, these uh, military ideas of the Crusaders did kind of start to spread to the Muslims to some extent. In fact, once we get to the Mamluks, the Mamluks are almost adopting kind of a heavy armored style um, that was a result of this interaction with the Crusaders. They were influenced by that. Now, at the same time, I don't want to detract from the effectiveness of the Turkish mounted archer. This was a very effective weapon of war. And it, for one thing, it was psychologically annoying. It was psychologically um, uh, unsettling to constantly be harassed by these, uh, these swift uh, Turkish archers. And it required an incredible amount of uh, discipline from knights and from their commander, especially, especially the commander, to be... Um, resistant to this temptation to charge off against these, uh, these harassing forces. Now, we have some classic examples of this. Of course, Richard the Lionheart was very good at this. We look at his march down the Palestinian coast. At the Battle of Arsuf, one thing that Richard did was he kept his army very closely and tightly formed as it marched with the infantry very close to the cavalry so that as Saladin's harassers were coming in to to attack and try to provoke a response, 
uh, Richard kept his knights from doing that. And he did that for a long time, and he waited until Saladin actually had to commit his entire force up against uh, Richard's army. Then there was a charge, and actually even then, um, the Hospitallers charged slightly early, but Richard took advantage of it and went ahead and just got everybody charging, and they absolutely smashed Saladin's army, just decimated them, and won you know, the incredible victory that was uh, the victory at the Battle of Arsuf. But in other situations, you know, these the Seljuk harassers, these Turkish harassers, could be absolutely devastating, like at, at the Battle of Hattin. You know, in that situation, uh, Guy of Lusignan had moved his army into an unfavorable position, which allowed the Turks to, to harass the Crusaders kind of at will. At the same time, uh, Saladin's army had cut the, the Crusaders off from water. Well, this made the harassment all the more, you know, irritating. And at the same time, um, there came a point when the infantry and the, and the cavalry were, were separated, and so the Turks were able to pick off the horses more easily. Which brings me to another point. Uh, horses could be very vulnerable to the Seljuk uh, Turkish harassers because horses were not as well protected as uh, the knights themselves. But that doesn't mean there, there weren't some armor pieces used on horses. There were, especially as time went on, there were, there were uh, some male uh, pieces that could be made to protect certain vulnerable parts of horses um, so the, uh, the lower part of the horse especially was vulnerable. There's some evidence for almost like kind of male pieces that hung off of, of uh, drapings on horses that could kind of help protect that lower portion of the horse. Some like plate pieces began to be adopted for, for horses, like a, a face uh, piece that would protect that part of the horse. One of the, the main things that, was, that could be used to protect um a, a knight's horse was what was called a caparison, which was almost like a quilted. It was kind of like, kind of uh, similar to the the idea that w behind the the padded jacket that was worn underneath the crusader's armor. We have kind of this padded, quilted um, thing that goes over the horse, and that can really do a lot against, especially you know. Again, we talk about the movement of the horse, um, the fact that an arrow coming at it is going to kind of be be deterred by the air itself and by the movement of the of the horse. Um, this could result in uh, arrows being deflected. But but again, the most important thing in protecting the horses was that the was the infantry screen, and um, the idea behind that was you force the enemy to commit to to battle, and then you deliver the charge. And at that point, the, the Muslims cannot escape, and they they get smashed by this charge. So, we uh, again, the Battle of Arsuf is a good example of that. Um, another example is the Battle of Azaz in 1125. Now, in this battle, the Muslims themselves tried to commit close to the Crusaders immediately. And the reason, I think, behind this was that um, they had often not had success with the harassing tactics, and so they were trying to force the issue and they, their numbers were considerably better than the Crusader numbers. So they thought that they would overwhelm them with numbers. Well, it was a devastating victory for the Crusaders, a, a total victory for the Crusaders. The Muslim forces were, were annihilated. Um, and it was because, again, because just in close quarters, when it came to close combat, the Crusaders always outdid the Muslims. There were times, though, of course, when this Muslim harassing tactic was very effective. The Second Crusade is a good example. When Louis VII of France was marching his army across Anatolia, he was not the, the top-notch commander that someone like Richard the Lionheart or Bowman was. And he kept his, his, uh, his soldiers, his knights and his infantry, marching too loosely. There were too many gaps. And the Turks were able to take brilliant advantage of this. They, they would come in and they would harass and they would uh, cause confusion. They devastated Louis's army this way. But again, a, lot, a big part of this was because Louis did not have his formation the way he should have. So a lot of this really did have to do with if you had a poor commander in charge of the, of the Crusader force, it could be the kiss of death. Again, Guy of Lusignan is a good example at the Battle of Hattin. Uh, Baldwin IV of Jerusalem was a brilliant general. He almost always outdid Saladin in the, in the field, even when Saladin had much larger numbers. 
the Battle of Montgasard is a good example. Of course, in that situation, there wasn't um, a harassing force really attacking the Crusaders. In that case, Saladin wasn't really, uh, he, he, he wasn't taking the Crusader force seriously because it was so small. He was allowing his army to kind of plunder the area, and Baldwin and the Templars delivered just a devastating charge that absolutely, you know, annihilated Saladin's forces. So, so yeah, I just want to kind of put to rest this idea that, yeah, this 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 silly idea that somehow chainmail was not effective. I think you know it's it's kind of a, a symptom of our modern prejudices. We look at a piece of chainmail, and to us, it it doesn't look like it could it could protect anything because we don't understand. For one thing, I think a lot of our modern reproductions of chainmail are very poor. The links are kind of far apart, and uh, it's not very well made. And it's not made with the uh, military ideas behind them that uh, chainmail was made back in the Middle Ages. You know, if you, if you could, and if you go to a museum and you look at a real suit of mail, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, this stuff was very well made, and the way it was made uh, helped deflect projectiles. It's, it's really interesting. I'm going to link to this this uh, video by Lindy Beige, which I think is very good, where he talks about uh, some of these very issues, about how, how mail was very effective. And one of the things Lindy Beige talks about in that video is the fact that chain mail was used for centuries. You know, for, for century after century, chain mail was the main form of armor used. Well, why would it be made over and over again if it wasn't effective? You know, everybody would have said, you know, this, this, we're wasting our time and our money here because chainmail took an incredibly long amount of time to make. It was very, very expensive. It'd be like kind of the equivalent of buying a really nice house today. It was something that you had to be very wealthy to own a good suit of mail. The only way that this would have been done over and over again for so long would have been if it was, if it was effective. And again, we know that it was effective. Um, okay, another example I want to talk about um, from the Battle of Arsuf. Uh, Saladin's chronicler, Baha Adin, he actually talks about how the Crusader infantry, who are also wearing mail, um, they were getting up to 10 arrows kind of in their, just kind of uh, stuck in their backs <clears throat> from the fighting, and it didn't phase them. Uh, so this is another thing about this, this padded jacket underneath the mail. Uh, that could you know, if the arrow actually did go in, if it did pierce the mail, it would kind of get stuck in that padding. And it wouldn't, uh, it, it could easily not break the skin. It could easily not get in enough to, to actually do damage to the, to the warrior himself. So, so this is a very interesting aspect of crusader warfare, that sometimes these knights would have like just some, some uh, stuff kind of bouncing some, some arrows kind of like a stuck stuck in their back or whatever, and it, it was you know not bothering them because they uh, they because yeah they they uh, the, the arrows had not pierced all the way through. So, all right, thanks very much for listening, guys. I'd like to say thanks to my latest Patreon supporter, Mike Darbo, who pledged a dollar monthly. Thanks, Mike. And if you're interested in seeing how this dynamic of the the Turkish mounted archer based up against the uh, Crusader Knight kind of played out. I, I portray this in my novel, Why Does the Heathen Rage? I talk about some combat between the Ortigid Turks and uh, Baldwin II of Jerusalem and his knights uh, up in the county of Edessa area. And I also depict the Battle of Azaz in 1125 in this novel. So I feel like I kind of, I was able to sort of convey what it might've felt like and looked like just in the moment, uh, in the field of battle. Um, how how a how a crusader stacked up against a, a Seljuk Turk or or a Turk an Ortigid Turk as is often the case in my novel. So so yeah, uh, check out the link below to my to to my Amazon page for my my book Why Does the Heathen Rage and you can pick up a copy of that. So hope everybody's having an excellent week. I'll talk to you soon. <laughs>